So before we get into this topic, let's just introduce our panel. We'll, you know, we'll start with Richard. If you could just say, uh, you know, your title and what you've been working on, and we'll go down the line, and then we'll get right into it. My name is Richard Detente. I come from Switzerland, and I'm the CEO, president, co-founder of Grandtong Crypto uh, Media in crypto. Great. Um, my name is Kwame Eopoku. I run uh, X Ventures, um, which is a crypto startup looking to push adoption across the continent. Hello. Yeah, my name is Nikweno. Um, I'm a teacher, but I work through a private company called Ghana.com that makes uh, kiosks and ATMs and payments with Bitcoin. Hi, uh, my name is Chio Minang and uh, I run a company that builds uh, Bitcoin circular economies. Uh, we've started one project in Cameroon called Bitcoin Mountain and uh, with that we're trying to have a proof of concept so that we could use our learnings to roll out other circular economies uh, across Africa especially. Okay, so today we're dealing with a backdrop of low yields, spiraling inflation, governments printing cash, and a lot of people say that you know Bitcoin as a store of value can be a, a solution to this, but the narrative that I keep hearing is if you look purely at prices, a year ago Bitcoin was trading at nearly $70,000, we're at $14,000 today, so there's that inherent volatility. You know, second to that, it's not the inflation hedge that it's promised to be, at least not yet, and we tend to see the price of Bitcoin track larger macroeconomic moves. Now it's still early days, but my question to the panel is, Bitcoin as a store of value, has it delivered on a mandate? And, and is it a safe haven during recessionary times? I put that out to anyone who wants to tackle the question. Maybe I start with store of value? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I come from the traditional market and the store of value, to be a store of value as gold, you have to be a mean of payment because if you can't pay, if you don't have an exit for your store of value, then you, can, you can't keep value. So what, what we see is that for the Western countries, they make price because they are speculating on if Bitcoin will go up or it will go down and will I see my money uh, in days. But in Africa and in uh, Latin America and developing countries, more discussion we have here today, these days, is about empowerment, is about adoption, is about how can I use Bitcoin as a mean of payment. So the value is in Africa and the price is in Westerner and in New York. So it's different. We are different <laughs> in this world. Um, so as somebody who sits on the continent, doesn't an interesting question. I, I got into Bitcoin in 2014. I've been here for about eight years. I'll consider myself late, but early than a lot of people. Um, for the last decade, 2011 till now, Bitcoin is up 20 million percent. Let me repeat that. For the last decade, Bitcoin is up 20 million percent. In that same time space, the Nasdaq 100 is up 542 percent, and the US large caps is up 282 percent. Which conversation are we having about store of value? I think it's already proven itself, right? I think it's already proven itself compared to other asset classes that it can do well. We can have conversations about the up and downs, you know, the bear markets, the bull markets. This is a general financial market thing. This is not just a Bitcoin thing. Uh, so I think just like we say generally in this space, zoom out. Once you zoom out, you realize that over time, as per performance, it probably is the most by practice and by evidence, the best store of value we've seen over the last decade. And, and that's why I sit. And I also like on the same idea of Bitcoin as a store of value, I've had a lot of conversations about Bitcoin as your bank, and that's especially uh, you know, key in places where the local currency is spiraling out of control, perhaps they're perhaps there are banking limits put into place. I recently did a story about Lebanon and we're focusing on the African continent today, but that's been a massive problem where people have seen their life savings completely evaporate. And I wonder if you're also seeing that same dynamic anywhere in the African continent where Bitcoin does become your bank and, and, and it's your first entry to uh, FinTech in a sense. Does anyone, you know, Chio or Ni, do you want to tackle that? Um, I didn't get the question. 
Like as you, you didn't yeah, get your yeah, question. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, anyone who wants to like, just this idea of Bitcoin being your bank and your savings account and being your first entry point to. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so for me, a store of value is uh, having an asset that is non-confiscatable, right? And uh, Bitcoin is the ultimate asset for which nobody can confiscate. Not a gun, not a bomb, not even nuclear weapons, right? Um, so if you have that as, as an asset and nobody can confiscate it, you're sure that you could store the fruit of your labor in that. Now, it is understood that there is uh, plenty of volatility today, as people say, but that depends on your numerai. What is the asset in which you value your, your goods? So if you value your goods in uh, the dollar, for example, you might think that uh, uh, Bitcoin is volatile to speak in terms of the dollar. But then you still have one Bitcoin. One Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. Yeah. So one way for people to really appreciate the store of value uh, functionality of Bitcoin is to, from the very beginning, before they start storing their value in Bitcoin, is to ask the question that, okay, uh, right now, one Bitcoin is $1,000, for example. And then you lock the value of what $1,000 can buy for you today, but then you hold that Bitcoin for 10 years. So if um, one Bitcoin could buy you, say, um, say, say $1,000 could get you a car, for example, right? Okay, now you lock down uh, that car and say 10 years from now, this one Bitcoin that I'm holding, is, still, is it still able to buy me that car? If the answer is yes, it doesn't matter what the price in, in, in uh, euro or dollar is leading up to those 10 yeah. years, just hold on to the Bitcoin. Although, of course, I had a question as to uh, technology being deflationary. And that question is, 10 years from now, would technology have made the car to become even cheaper? Right. So there are two considerations to have. Number one is, a store of value has to be an asset that is non-confiscatable, right? So that you could keep it and nobody can take it away from you. Because even if you have the dollar and the price is stable, somebody can seize it from you. So that's not a very good store of value. Um, so first thing, non-confiscatable makes it a great store of value. Second thing, it is deflationary. It means that over time, technology would have made other goods and services to be very easy to produce, and this Bitcoin that you had held would be able to buy even more goods and services, so you're able to convert that into even more um, value. Of course, in the present, um, because we're watching Bitcoin still being monetized in real time, you might not be able to pay for your goods and services in Bitcoin everywhere. So you still need you know, fiat currency and things like that. Um, at Bitcoin Mountain, the uh, first Bitcoin circular economy we're trying to build in Cameroon, uh, we're trying to create an environment to test uh, uh, how Bitcoin could be adopted. And what we're advising uh, our community members, because we've started a, a, a Bitcoin community bank, kind of like what they're doing in uh, Bitcoin Beach in El Salvador with right. Bitcoin Wallet. So we do have Bitcoin Mountain Wallet. So we have two account balances. There's one in Bitcoin BTC. And we advise our users to think of that as their long-term savings account, right? Put some BTC there, don't look at it for 10 years. But then you have uh, a fiat you know, balance that you could use to pay for your goods and services uh, day to day. Uh, so for me, again, uh, Bitcoin is the ultimate store of value. First, because it's non-confiscatable. And uh, second, um, uh, the second thing is it, it is deflationary, right? So yeah, well, time, let me, I want to push, so push you on that. So the deflationary yeah. characteristic, yeah. because yes, the, it will be capped at 21 million Bitcoin that are issued. Yeah. But right now, we're not seeing any sort of um, inflation hedge characteristics. So wh when do we got, get to see that anti-inflationary uh, characteristic take effect in the price? And the second thing I wanted to ask about um, is you mentioned that we're thinking about it the wrong way by denominating Bitcoin in US dollars, but so much of the thought process still comes back to what the price of the US dollar is, and that's why you're seeing US dollar peg stable coins like Tether um, be such a popular mode of uh, you know, transacting across the African continent as well. So first question on deflation, second question on when do we kind of break this thinking of connecting Bitcoin to the price of the US dollar? Um, I think if, if I heard the question correctly, when, when do we start pricing things in Bitcoin and not the US dollar? Is that, is that a yeah, question? so when do we break thinking, like our thinking of Bitcoin as denominated in US dollars? Let's okay. tackle that question first, Good then question. we'll come yeah. back to so, deflationary. So the, the, the truth is, we, we, we cannot know, and, and what's happening now is everybody is speculating as to when that would be, yeah. right? And that's a function of the market. Um, first of all, I think the, the, 
a lot of the inflation that we see is because of you know government money printing, right? And that money has to go someplace. So there will be all of this money printing. There isn't a place to spend it, so people have to speculate on, on, on Bitcoin. It would raise the price and then it would crash and, and stuff like that. But of course, there is continuous adoption of Bitcoin, right? So over time, this volatility would be reducing because the amount of money that gets into that asset as speculation is smaller than how that asset is used as money. But we cannot know, so we depend on the speculation markets to figure out when that will be. But over time, the volatility will keep reducing as there is greater and greater adoption. I'm going to actually shift course and go into payments because there's a lot to unpack there. You have, of course, the Lightning Network, our layer two payment technology, and that's being used to facilitate, of course, Bitcoin transactions. Strike and Jack Maulers are, are doing very interesting things in terms of using it just as you know, the plumbing of fiat transactions, so people don't even realize necessarily that they're uh, using Bitcoin tech to facilitate fiat-based transactions. You heard from Ray Youssef earlier, kind of getting into the nuances of decentralized exchanges and peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So there are this, this huge menu of ways that you can transact in crypto. What, is, what are people using on the ground? Like, what is, like, how are we seeing crypto, or Bitcoin in particular, used to transact across the continent. I'd love to hear examples and what's you know most prevalent. In fact, to to see how Bitcoin is used, you have to go in country where the volatility of the money is equal or higher to Bitcoin. If you look at uh, as a financial asset, you see that Bitcoin, despite its volatility, has an upward trend. That was what Kwame was saying, and that's a powerful characteristic because uh, fiat money, by construction, because um, fiat money have to maintain a social, social order. It have to have a spending by government to uh, politic, political aim, objectives. So it has a downward trend because uh, money loses its value to financing uh, tax. It's a form of, of tax. So if you go to uh, Nigeria, if you go uh, to, uh, to Ghana, where we where we here, you see that people uh, are making a choice between uh, two equivalent volatility. So in both cases, uh, it's a problem. But in one way, with Bitcoin, it's upward. And with fiat money, it's downward. So the, the choice is easy. And that is why in Nigeria we, we speak about one uh, person of uh, three which uses Bitcoin. It's huge. And that, uh, that explains why in America or in Europe, when you speak about Bitcoin at, uh, at uh, everybody, anyone in the street, he, he, he's saying, but what, what's, the, what's the aim? What the, how, how can I use Bitcoin? I don't know anyone using Bitcoin. Because, in fact, we live in two different worlds, and the market makes an arbitrage of uh, Western, uh, Western countries and developing countries. And why the price of Bitcoin uh, may stop to fall at $3,000? Why? What is explaining that? My, my guess is uh, the adoption is going on and going on. And today we speak, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to say, but something about 200 million of people using Bitcoin. And Westerners say, where are they? <laughs> 200 million people. Why, why do I look, I don't look anyone? Because they don't live in our well, neighborhood. OK, but let's take the example you mentioned. So you've, obviously, Nigeria is a place where we've seen a great deal of crypto adoption, despite the fact that the government has banned it, uh, is very threatened by it. How are people using it? Like, is it peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transactions on a platform like Paxful? And then are, are you using Bitcoin to do that? Is it you know, US dollar pegged stable coins like Tether? I, I mean, I just, I, like, I, would, I wanna know, like, get into the okay. weeds of how we're seeing daily crypto transactions. And are you paying for your groceries in Bitcoin? Or is it about trading for like physical bills and then using that to pay? Like, break it down for me. Um, maybe I'll come in here. Um, <laughs> Okay, let me okay. just make a quick comment here. I think uh, we should change the store value a little. Um, I think the real value Bitcoin is bringing um, has to do with forcing a rethink around the separation of the state um, 
from money. Yeah. And I think that reform may end up being much better for Bitcoin in the long run. And so we need to be uh, looking at a larger picture of, that it will take some time. And reforms of this nature will benefit both the regulatory environment as well as the operators, as well as the users. And we should be heading more towards uh, taking advantage of this message Bitcoin is bringing to move towards multi-stakeholder approach of having these discussions so that we don't talk only to ourselves so that the very people who uh, might be impacted will also have a chance to tell us how to impact them better right. and therefore help us in the mainstreaming of Bitcoin. Right. This is the direction I'm right. right. But I, I think just to add to that and to answer the question as to how we're using it, I, I get the opportunity to travel the continent a lot To I'm an evangelist for Bitcoin and, and crypto as a whole. Um, I hope Farida doesn't beat me for this. But if, if you look at what w the everyday person, you know, for instance, if you look at Nigeria, uh, Nigeria does, I think, the fourth highest volume in the world in terms of Bitcoin transactions. That's outstanding if you think about our continent, right? Um, again, over 60% of the 1.4 billion people on this continent do not have access to financial instruments. Uh, it's another thing. I have a, a, a community, I think a few of my, do, I have, do we have Medici's here? Can I get a wave? Okay, a few of my community members are here. The everyday young person, 18, 35, who's using crypto, a lot of P2P transactions um, through platforms that like Passful, they are part of this. Uh, a dominant player that I might not be able to mention because of um, you know, where we are sitting. Uh, gets a lot of P2P transactions happening. Uh, a lot of the people playing in the space are playing in the investor trading space. So we do have a lot of people trading it as a financial instrument, instrument speculating uh, for profit. I can say to you very strongly that about 95% of the people playing in uh, the Bitcoin space are doing it for profit for now. We love the tech, but let's make some money. <laughs> um, wealth acquisition is a big thing. So there's a lot of people who are playing in the day-to-day -day trading, um, you know, can I buy it low, sell it high type of idea. And a lot of it is happening via P2P. I think one of the biggest problems we have on the continent is on and off-ramp. Uh, fiat entering from one end and then exiting crypto on the other. There is still a huge bottleneck for that to happen. Um, and then there's general, probably not part of the question, but probably the biggest of issues we have is education. It's, it's just how ignorant. And by the way, let me add this. The first wave of uh, evangelists who brought the Bitcoin conversation to the continent, um, it was characterized by a lot of scam. So there's also a, a whole group of very early adopters who are totally spreading the message of a hey, hey, that's a red flag, right? Mm -hmm. so, so those are some of the things. But generally, P2P transactions, speculating for profit, holding for long term. A lot of people are looking at this bear market as an opportunity for what can happen in the bull market. Um, but generally, those are the types of things that happen. In, in Liberia, some of the examples you were given, I don't know if you've seen the kind of inflation. Uh, no, not Liberia, uh, Zimbabwe, yeah. um, <laughs> where they buy bread with billions of Zimbabwean dollars. Uh, in Ghana, about three months ago, our uh, currency depreciated by almost 43% mm. uh, from beginning of year. Uh, so there are a lot of people who at that time were panicking and going, where should I throw my CDs to? So there's also all of that. People use it as a hedge every now and then, uh, that absolute control that they're able to have. And finally, a, a lot of people use it to escape the bureaucratic, lethargic processes of banking. About five, six years ago, the last time I used a bank, I was doing a transaction of $300. My transaction charge was $190. Like, if I had that extra $190, you'd think I would be, what's wrong with you, you know? So there are a lot of people who also use it to escape. I do a Tether transaction in two minutes. It's hit my account. I paid less than a dollar. Why would I go queue at a bank for seven hours for them to ask me, where did you get that money from? And so a lot of people also use that to circumvent. We can look at the bad sides of that, but generally, the good that it is doing for our people, these are some of the things. The remittance? 
Remittance yeah, also is beginning to happen yeah. um, it's, it's in some a, spaces. It's a really interesting subject because I, I, I went in uh, San Salvador and I went in um, Center Africa. And in both countries, there is huge remittance because the, um, there is a lot of uh, people who left the country. But in Salvador, there is a um, better statistical number. So when uh, Bitcoiners go to see Nayib Bukele, they said, OK, Western Union is taking something like 400 million a year uh, of commission. And if you use Bitcoin, just in America, buy Bitcoin, send uh, Bitcoin to your mother in San Salvador, and then she can buy uh, mobile money or dollars, uh, etc." then you can spare 400 million. And it was a great uh, argument for Nayib Bukele. And then we go to Central Africa, we met the president, we met the government, and we say, hey, the remittance, do you know? <laughs> you can spare a lot of commission. And uh, the government told me, no, but th there is no remittance. They said, no, you're kidding. <laughs> in fact, there is no statistical number of remittance. But I know people in France who, 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 who send money in Central Africa, Congo, etc. So the, the, the view of uh, Bitcoin adoption is really difficult to observe because it's spreading from the bottom. Everywhere there's no um, banking system, so no statistic. Everywhere there's no... Um, everything, <laughs> more or less, then Bitcoin has a way because the trouble are a lot, a lot of uh, biggest than the, the, the difficulty to use Bitcoin. And that's fascinating. Yeah, you know, and I think that one of the you know, ultimate visions of the Lightning Network that I find especially compelling is this idea of disrupting legacy payment rails that have been in place for decades. Um, and you see a lot of these cuts, these, a lot of these fees go to credit card companies or to banks, and, and the fact that the vision is to eliminate that kind of friction from global transactions, I find it fascinating. Um, I, I want to shift course here. There are other forms of electronic currency, like Kenya's and Pesa, and my question is, how is Bitcoin an improvement? Uh, how is it worse? Will it ultimately lose out to central bank digital currency? Some, some countries across the continent have been leaning into that. Uh, but I'd, yeah, I'd love to hear someone kind of break down the nuances of, of how Bitcoin compares to the M-Pesa, for example. They're shutting down the light. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. They want us out of here. <laughs> well, um, so Bitcoin is an open global network. M-Pesa is not, right? Simple. Um, th that's just it. Yeah. And um, we're now in the knowledge economy. Right? So it's possible for you to just create content, put that content online, and you're paid for that content. Now, yourself, you would use the money that you earned to pay for other content online without even depending on off-ramps. Right? That's stuff that you cannot do with uh, M-Pesa. So if indeed we're having a knowledge economy that's getting bigger and bigger worldwide, we need a global open access network with an internet native uh, currency without even using uh, off-ramps. Um, so yeah, that is just way better than, than M-Pesa. And, and, and again, um, so for instance, in pesa the Ghana version is called mobile money. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest limitations is interoperability, right? Because there are various networks. There is this network and there's that network. And it was just until recently that we were able to send from one network directly onto another network. So there's the limitation of, and if you want to move money from M-Pesa to Ghana, you're going to need an intermediary yeah. or a third party for you to be able to move something from M-Pesa for me to access it via Momo or any other thing. So, so Bitcoin is way better in the fact that it is decentralized and it is global. It is open access to everybody. You don't, have any, you don't need to have any requirements. You don't need to have a particular SIM card. You know, th that makes it absolutely and, different. And mobile money is an accident. Because, you know, the, the quality of uh, state money wasn't so great. Right. So uh, people just uh, think and say, well, what do we have? We have stones, we have <laughs> and we have uh, telephone credits, smartphone credits. So go, we use it. And the, the, the intelligence, the smartness of people in developing country is just incredible because they use everything they have under their hand. And mobile money is that kind of tool. 
But Bitcoin is way, way higher because it was designed to be useful and there's no uh, trust party. There's no, you can, uh, Bitcoin is a small, small bullet that made a hole in, uh, in, a, in the wall of monopoly fiat systems. Since, since uh, Bitcoin was invented, everybody in the world <laughs> started to make new money. <laughs> and uh, the world of cryptocurrencies, everything you can, uh, everything you can think about uh, shitcoins, it's um, something fantastic because everyone's starting spreading new money. And uh, Hayek, the economist, I, I think would be so, uh, so joyful <laughs> to see that because money is a tool in economy. It's mean of exchange, store of value, etc. And there is interest rate. With interest rate, you put a price on the time. With exchange rate, you put a price on the space. Uh, may, uh, do I have to, to build to here or do I have to buy abroad? And money is just the mean of circulating the value. So the more you have value, the more the competition will be and you, the, the, the market with selection uh, will selection the best currency for each usage. So we can have a world with uh, a number of money, and it's good because it will have new usage. Yeah, I thought I would point out that uh, <laughs> uh, money seems to be uh, the best known tool for mass cooperation right. okay, across boundaries. And it appears Bitcoin does it very well. And to the extent it does it so well that uh, I want to posit that uh, it will help reform the whole financial sector uh, and in the process improve Bitcoin's own presence as well as avoid um, recession uh, techniques. Right. Because it's very difficult in the present economy to get all the points right. And, uh, if, and perhaps you shouldn't do it. Yeah. And so the example of Bitcoin will lead the entire you know, financial reform uh, to become more accommodating of these techniques that Bitcoin espouses. Right. And then in the process also uh, improve the financial sector altogether. That's the direction. I want. You know, as we need to, to be mainstream, we're going to have to subject ourselves to some, um, you might say, uh, dialogue across the ecosystem regarding what works for who and for what and for what purpose. And we know how to do consensus. So at some point, we're going to have a document that we all agree to, which will make it so much better that we can avoid recession in the long run. While I have you, you built out the web infrastructure in Africa. Now we're seeing the, you know, Everyone talking about the buzzword of Web3, we have the Bitcoin network, those are not the same thing, but what is the next iteration of the internet and, and how does it compare to what you saw when you had a front row seat to <laughs> rolling out the internet across the continent? Okay, uh, it's difficult to tell what next, but we can tell direction. And the direction is similar to what Bitcoin is pointing to, meaning that the end user needs to be more empowered uh, to have more decision powers on whatever uh, asset they have. Uh, there are groups that are looking more towards um, uh, managing the consolidation which has occurred, the centralization which has occurred, by taking off uh, the decision to use my information from the centralized organization uh, to the individual. And it's much the same way as Bitcoin is also going in the sense that it's saying that the end user it really should have his control. And every time he goes into a centralized situation, he gets into more trouble, right? That's the exchanges. Um, so the whole you know, drive is towards the individual deciding what can be said or sold or used or known, in essence, about themselves. And I think it's a good thing because it totally decentralizes, except, of course, we have to be organized as well. Okay, so it's difficult to ignore the fact that uh, the confidence has been shaken in the wider crypto industry with the fall of FTX, and it's been six <laughs> very difficult months for the wider industry. 
Now, a lot of people in this room know that we're talking about centralized players, whether it's in the lending space or exchanges, and that is very different to what we're talking about here at the Bitcoin network. But it's very easy to conflate the two. Uh, if you're new to the space or you're looking to get involved, has this set back Bitcoin adoption? And if so, for how long? Or do you think, if anything, it's just strengthened the argument for why to only transact in Bitcoin? Maybe in Congo and Central Africa, they don't care about FTX because FTX is not crypto. It's just a uh, financial intermediary like uh, Enron, like uh, your banks, like everything. So the adoption, and uh, we, we have uh, people who can speak about that here, are not, uh, are not playing in FTX uh, account, I think, I guess. Um, I, I think my answer to that is yes. To be very honest, what has happened to, I mean, what has happened with FTX has set us back a couple years or so. But the, the three things I want to point out, first, uh, first, this is not new. We've seen this before. We've seen Mt. Gox. We've seen Cryptopia. We've seen this before. Um, secondly, when you look at, so there's something called a Gartner hype cycle for every single technology, and it is cycles that any tech goes through from when it is birthed to when it gets to mass adoption, right? If you look at the kind of euphoria stage we went in at the beginning of the year, uh, and the fact that for those of you who are probably new to crypto, um, there was something called a meme season or a shitcoin season, uh, we, we needed this cleanse, you know, it was necessary for something heavy to punch us in the gut for us to go, some bad actors need to die. And we needed a black swan event of epic proportions for that to happen. And FTS delivered that for us. Uh, from where I sit, <laughs> from where I sit, this is the single biggest opportunity of a lifetime. Thank you, FTX. Um, <laughs> um, it, it does erode confidence to an extent especially for newbies, for people who got burned, uh, it was bad. I don't want to sit here and, and make it a light issue. People died out of this, at least from the reports that we heard. So it's not something that's light, but it was necessary uh, for the way that the industry was moving. And, and it pointed us to a very core principle. And I think this is what makes Bitcoin Maxis very, very happy to say that, look, this thing needs to completely remain decentralized. And as far as we have centralized players, no matter how they're clothed, no matter how they present their value proposition and, and their trust options, we run away from an entire system because of this very reason. So I think that Black Swan event gave us a reminder once again, not your keys, not your assets. We needed that cleanse. It has set us back, but I feel like the, the pool and um, push effect for how far back we've been stretched. I feel like the bounce back. How long would it take for us to bounce back in terms of confidence? There's still people in this room. I mean, a few people have left, but you still had a full. There's still people in the room. There's still people who are learning. It gives us an opportunity to build um, and really put out the, the utility. One thing, but, well, the one thing I do wonder about is just, the, I mean, centralized exchanges like Coinbase were instrumental in onboarding a lot of newbies who Agreed. just didn't really know how it worked. It is very scary to think about, you know, self-custody for right. some people. Right. So, I mean, do we still scale in the same way if trust in centralized exchanges is totally eroded? Like, can you parallel that kind of adoption with DEXs and with self-custody? So it's an interesting one. I think the thing that we've noticed about the growth of this industry is every time we get hit, yeah. we, it allowed us to iterate the next level of innovation that will take us to another space of trust. So for instance, now centralized exchanges have to show proof of reserves. That never happened until this Black Swan event. True. It's a good step. So I think these things are necessary. Um, and, and so it, it will keep coming, and we will keep fixing it, and we will keep finding ways to deal with it. Um, yeah, that's, that's really, you don't want to But know. FTX is not about crypto. FTX is about corruption. <laughs> I mean... Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like the act of a centralized and, player, and right. it's uh, important it's, to distinguish it's that. More, the, the trouble is more than centralization, because, uh, yes, it's centralized, 
but he doesn't even have a list of the bank account. And this man is always running in street and is not in custody and invited in yeah. conference and say, oh, Mr. SBF, can you tell us? What I agree. But okay. <laughs> My last thing I want to bring up, because we can't end this panel without also talking about the earning side of Bitcoin. So we've talked about transacting in it and saving in it. Uh, Bitcoin mining, it's a topic that I cover a lot, I think a lot about, and, and one thing, just before we go, I, I want to kind of think about it as also a tool for income, but also facilitating infrastructure build out. So, I, I, you know, I, I've been having some conversations with people who say that um, right now it creates this financial incentive to build out infrastructure, to harness the power of stranded renewable energy, and then you can create microgrids around that, which then can service a community that might not even know what Bitcoin is or have never even heard of Bitcoin, but they do know that they're getting cheaper power uh, that's more reliable. And I think that that's Fascinating. Like, I think that's such a, a really cool use case. And can anyone on the panel kind of speak to, like, how much we're seeing that happen? Like, just how how scalable is that? Uh, because it seems enormously powerful. On mining? Yeah, with mining. The mining is really, really interesting because uh, in developing, in, in Western countries, there is no extra capacity and the grid is already at its optimum. Because, uh, yeah. but in Africa, uh, for example, you have extra capacities, and moreover, you have green extra capacities. Yeah. So you are not the objective of the regulation about carbon, and you are uh, you you are the good uh, the good target. So if you are able to uh, to put ASICs, a container of ASICs to mine in uh, Virunga, in uh, Kenya, or in whatever, then it, it works like a tax on uh, rich countries because uh, the, the people speculating on Bitcoin uh, are paying uh, for, uh, for transaction. And this money goes down to the pocket of a uh, miner in Africa, and they buy the electricity of the government or the, the company which produces the electricity. The point is, the more you decentralize the mining, the more you will be able to diffuse the money. And it's really important to, to take care, to be cautious of the centralization of the mining industry, which is a, a long-term phenomenon because it's an industry. So if we can... Um, I am setting a company, CleanSat Mining, which, have to, which is about to, to sell shares of, uh, of ASICs in many different countries. Because if we have uh, two, five, ten percent of the block produced by decentralized mining in small factories, then it will be really strong for the network to, to, yeah. to go on. Anyone else want to weigh on this? Well, on a a this? couple of comments. Um, uh, yeah. I, I think um, um, we should be cautious um, in some sense, in that in the internet, we are used to things breaking right. and putting them back. Right. Um, so to see something broken and say, ah, the whole world, already you've lost your one chain because now you are casting doubts on yourself and confidence on yourself. And so the regulator will begin to uh, seek more answers from us. On the other hand, if we accept that even the, the instrument you are riding on, which is the internet, we accept that it's fragile and it breaks. And we try to imbibe the best practices that can hold it together. It is the same sort of thing that we need to do in the Bitcoin community and even be drafting documents on what are the good practices that every new entrant ought to be following, whether it is a, a user entrant or it's a, a miner or some other kind of provider. Now, in the, in the mining space, we, we did a fair amount of mining here in Ghana, but as the, you know, the halving uh, kept going on, uh, it did become more and more difficult, meaning it required a lot more investment uh, in uh, solar or whatever it is your, your renewable is in order to be able to, to sustain that. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, it is an opportunity that uh, can be followed. 
what we tended to do rather was to uh, mine a different kind of uh, environment uh, and then maybe focus more on the, the services, the payment services. And by the way, even in that area, let's not think of operating by ourselves, okay? Because you need, you need the off-rail <laughs> to get to the coin right. and even sometimes back. Right. And uh, for a provider who wants to uh, do well, he will do both. Okay, and so we are talking about mainstreaming. We want to become regular, like any other kind of money. So we want the policy environment to recognize us. We would like the regulator to set some proper guidelines on how to go about it so yeah. that we can provide the interfacing, the interconnection between the different rails right. that many people don't even care exists. I mean, let, let, let us hide it and let us process it so that it becomes easy for the ordinary person to be able to benefit right. Uh, without necessarily knowing how Visa moved the money or how I moved the Bitcoin from one person to the other. This is the kind of attitude I'm, I'm trying to come up with, saying that we're going to have to become normal. And to become normal is to be like normal, connect with everybody, make it available to everybody, let regulator understand, let regulator do his bit of it, and let us also educate the regulator. Because I'm trying to argue that Bitcoin will lead us into avoidance of recession. Okay, because of the model, the example it sets, and it will influence everything. And when it does, we'll have a much, much better uh, financial economy to work in. Yeah. Last question. I, Ray Yusuf said something earlier that stuck with me. He said there are 2,000 different payment networks across the content. 2% of them talk to one another. I, how... <laughs> I mean, do you envision a world in which, well, I mean, I, I know that you do, but how realistic is it in the next, like, five years that Bitcoin become, could become a universal currency of the continent or of the world? And, and I think that part of why Ray's example earlier also resonated with me is he said, think about it this way. Like, if you had 50 different currencies in the U.S. for each one of the states and you're trying to do anything across <laughs> borders, like, that's a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> um. So there was a comment I was going to make about uh, your question uh, concerning uh, Bitcoin, mining, mi Bitcoin mining and uh, uh, tapping all of the stranded energy that, that we have. Um, I think that the, the thing that actually makes Bitcoin deflationary money is all the amount of energy that goes into it. You could think of Bitcoin as a battery that stores energy. Now for, for us in Africa in particular, I think that should make us really excited because it gives us the opportunity to harness cheap, almost free energy, store it in a medium that whose value will be going up and up over time, and we can use that to buy machinery, to buy equipment, to boost our industrialization, right? So I think that is the, the mining industry and using free renewable stranded energy to convert that and store in a battery called Bitcoin, right. to later use that to purchase the equipment that we right. need to industrialize. It's, 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 for me, the most fascinating thing about uh, uh, Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin can harness all the energy that we need, store it in deflationary money, make that money to be so valuable that we could then use it to purchase all the equipment and the uh, machinery that we need to industrialize and live prosperous lives just like with everybody else. Um, so uh, that was the comment I wanted to make about uh, uh, the mining industry and uh, tapping free renewable energy, especially in, in Africa. Yeah. yeah. Well, I thought, do you want to finish us off? I thought I would make a comment on the universal coin. <laughs> I, I, I think we are not moving in that direction. We may be moving in the direction of multi-currency environment as opposed to a universal. Um, you know, because the universal uh, requires a lot of uh, sovereign substitutions that I'm not sure we are going to be able to uh, manage within the uh, the time frame that we have. On the other hand, I believe that uh, it is easier for people to accept that when you are separating the state from money, you don't go to only one money. Mm. You go to multi-money. And so Bitcoin will play its role as the one who has pointed this out to us. And that role will be a very good successful role because it will influence the other kinds of monies or regulations around those monies. Yeah. Kwame, finish me off on this question of, of uh, whether uh, Bitcoin would be adopted at, at that kind of level of, you know, across the continent, across the world. Like, what would that take? And, I mean, how realistic is that time? Um, I, I think I would agree with Prof. Um, 
and, and this is why I have a love and hate relationship with Bitcoin Maxis. I, I love you, brother, don't worry. Um, but I think I agree with Prof in that in the short to midterm, a, a one, a multi, like a singular currency thing that we all go towards, like he said, would require a certain level of sovereign um, and agreement across boards that might not happen in the short term. Uh, so maybe that shouldn't be our aim in the short term. I think that what the, the aim should be should, should, can we look at what Satoshi's core thinking was that gave birth to this industry we're sitting in? We're looking at censorship proof. We're looking at decentralization. We're looking at personal sovereignty over your own identity, over your own ownership of things. Um, and your own wealth, right? And I think as far as those tenants are in play, as pillars that any of the, the, the players in the space are looking to, then we would be fine in the short to midterm. Maybe in the near future, maybe in the far future, we can get to a place where a single currency, of course, Bitcoin is preferred now to any other currency anywhere, by the way, compared to any other currency on the market, whether that's Ether, whatever. Bitcoin is still supreme. It's the first one, it's the one who has stayed the longest, it is the one who has suffered the most atrocities and still survived. So it is still the king and the leader of the entire industry. Would it be the only one that survives over time? Only time will tell. I think that's a good note to end on. Thank you guys so much for staying late. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your expertise, panelists. And let's all go eat dinner. <laughs>